A uh, question for Carlos. Uh, my understanding is that uh, a few months ago they, uh, whoops. I hope we're not melting down here. Uh, a few months ago, a, uh, a solar power plant came online in Spain. Uh, this solar power plant uh, is interesting because it produces electricity at night. About 60% of, uh, of the rated electricity during the day is produced at night. The size of it is enough for about 40,000 homes. And uh, I think the economic payback time is something like 11 years or so for it. Uh, the, 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 what they use for storage is something you haven't talked about, and that is the, uh, they use some sort of uh, uh, molten, molten salt. salt. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering uh, how the use of molten salt uh, in combination with something like uh, solar plus wind would uh, essentially level out your curves. Yes. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt about it. Like, uh, this, uh, this is uh, CSP uh, technology, like the concentrated solar. This is a power. I think you are referring to the Sevilla power plant, right? Uh, yeah, molten salt has been around. Uh, it's, uh, it's a complicated technology, like in case of failure. Uh, because if, uh, if molten salt uh, at any point, like, you know, uh, freezes, like, you know, at the mm -hmm. salt temperature of freezing, like, you know, you, you have, like, you know, uh, massive failure of your equipment. You have to replace that. Uh, the, these technologies are, are, are really, we have an, a new power plant coming up very close to here, like a four hours and a half by car, like you know, the Ivan Pa uh, power plant. I'm going there like in, uh, in 10 days like, uh, to, to talk with them about forecasting. Uh, that power plant is also concentrated on towers, like, but they have no storage. It's a steam, like, no, yeah, all CSP after some level, like the technology is 150 years old. Like you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you after like you, know, you generate the high temperature, everything else runs out of uh, like, you know, steam turbines and so on. Uh, so yeah, these are in terms of uh, competitiveness, economically uh, viable uh, solutions. Like they become uh, competitive after 40 megawatts, uh, and so like it's, it's for larger like mm -hmm. central plant uh, types of uh, operation. The issue has been like in many of those like you know has been financing like you know, like the resourcing like do we know like you know those depend on the direct beam from the sun mm -hmm. so if there's a cloud for example like like I showed in my uh, movie like it goes down to zero so you you thermal <coughs> storage like is a great help in that sense because you can ride that like a variability uh, but the the main problem for this type of technology has been the unbelievable drop of a price in uh, PV panels. Uh, so a large uh, uh, power plant like that like employs many, many people, like hundreds of people to run. Uh, we have a very old one here in Mojave, like you know, SEGS, that uh, is integrated with the, with the gas too. Uh, it, it employs like hundreds of people like you know, year round. Uh, there is a nice benefit on this sense, right? Like a PV power plant may have like a couple of people working most of the time like you know, uh, remotely, right? Uh, so the, the economic issues like uh, are really on the table now. Like Google pulled out a lot of the money from uh, the Ivan Pa uh, development because of the drop of the price of the panels uh, and so on. So yeah, these are viable technologies like that are used. Like you still need like a, some level of forecast like because your storage is not over like a week, for example. If you have a week of uh, overcast weather, like no, you want to know this ahead of time and uh, tell people. So there are. Absolutely, these are these are viable things that are beautiful power plants. I I love to go visit them. Uh, thank you. How much would uh, efficiency of use of electricity and um, other part, kinds of energy help us reduce the need? I'm not quite clear whether uh, we can reduce our electrical needs by lots or just a little, and I'm wondering whether. UCSD is doing any work using electronics to conserve the use of energy? Uh, yes. Uh, in the loading order, energy efficiency is number one. And uh, 
this campus for the last four years has had a $22 million a year energy efficiency retrofit program, and uh, this year it's $32 million. Uh, Anna Lovett was here just earlier, but she left and she's the manager of that program. So in the initial years, we took the low-hanging fruit and expedited that, and then now we've moved up to the middle of the tree, the far greater challenges with uh, longer paybacks. But uh, as, a, as a university, we have, uh, over the last four years, reduced our total energy consumption by 11%. But our SDG&E bill of what we do import has gone up by 23%. I know that doesn't make sense, but it's uh, the gap is widening. And that 11% reduction in our electricity has come at a time over the last five years, we've had a $200 million a year capital construction program. So we're having energy creep. So what when we build something new, it's very efficient, a LEED certified gold, or in one case, platinum. And then what we've already built, we are uh, judiciously spending, again, on about $22 million a year of retrofitting those programs from an energy efficiency point of view. On the, sort of the opposite scale from what we're doing locally on campus, the projections that I showed about looking forward on a global scale for carbon-free energy requirements uh, are quite sensitive to uh, what's uh, called energy intensity, that is how much energy per unit of improvement in human economic activity or quality of life. Um, the projection that I showed is basically assumed historical rates of improvement of that figure of merit. Um, that author goes uh, into um, more details in, in that document, shows if we could about double or triple the rate of improvement of energy efficiency improvements, or, or then you can make a vast reduction in the amount of carbon-free energy that we would need. But we've never, and, and that has to be done on a global scale, not just at a particular region, uh, but we've never actually managed to show that we can get to those rates of efficiency improvements. Maybe we can. California has done a, California has done a beautiful job in terms of uh, uh, improving the efficiency over time, like we double the population with a very little increase like in, in, in total uh, load. Uh, so I, it's not impossible, but like, no, I think uh, it's something that takes a concerted effort to be done. But to just go back to David uh, Victor's point, sometimes those gains are achieved by moving manufacturing to some other place in the world. And so yes. you, one has to be careful uh, about uh, keeping track of such things. So. Just a uh, quick... Um, Everyone, uh, please keep your name. You don't have to, please. Okay. <laughs> 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 There's some law somewhere. Sure. Uh, Sean Morgan. I'm a GSR with the center. Um, just a quick clarification question. You were uh, you, you had a lot of estimates for available capacity up there, uh, and I'm wondering about the hydro estimate. Is that just large-scale hydro, or does that include micro-hydro, tidal power, that type of thing? And if it doesn't, do you know how that changes the estimate? Right. It's just a rough estimate of the um, large-scale ones. Okay. Yeah. Um, even the compressed air estimate, uh, it's based on what's already implemented in the old technology. I know there's also a lot of improvement on the compressed air technologies. Okay. Um, it's uh, review articles um, done by battery people, so you can see it's not uh, completely uh, objective. I guess. <laughs> <So biased. laughs> yeah. Thanks, Martin Bunz, Philosophy Rutgers. I'd, I'd like to go back to George Tynan's um, slide from Marty Hoffert's uh, paper, uh, if we can imagine it, and if you want to put it up, but. The one thing that emphasizes time, and in your presentations, there's very little attention to the question of how the kinds of innovations you're talking about map onto the time needs. Yes. You're very cautious in your initial comments, as with David Victor, on the question of cause versus correlation on energy consumption. I don't quite understand the um, cautious attitude to this in that I think it's relatively well established that 
Energy consumption is a precondition. Growth in energy is a precondition for growth economically. Economic growth is a precondition for population control. And one pe very pessimistic scenario is unless we improve economic wealth throughout the world, we're likely to top out at 15 billion yes. rather than 9 billion by the end of the year. And so we're screwed in terms of energy consumption that way. If we hope to stabilize at 9 billion with energy growth, the key question becomes whether or not there is a reasonable timetable by which these kinds of innovations can be deployed that's consistent with this growth pattern. And I wondered if you could, uh, could comment on that. Um, I had debated whether to, how to show the link between human quality of life and, and energy access, and one of the merits is actually population growth rate. There's a very clear correlation between those two. So uh, in, in my class on uh, renewable energy, we talk about, uh, we make projections about uh, where do we top out in terms of population growth. So in order to, uh, if you take those correlations between growth rate and energy access, if you want to sort of reach a stable population at 10 billion, uh, then by 2040 or so, you need to have two to three times the amount of global energy access around the whole world. And if you want to meet the carbon constraints, then nearly all of that has to come from carbon free sources. And so I would say we are nowhere on track to meet that at the present day. We're doing, we're meeting the energy demand with fossil fuels. Uh, and so my guess is yes, we'll, we'll reach those population uh, projections, but we will blow through all the carbon uh, modeling that, that we, we think we have to hit. So, so, so if I can follow up, this is your question to show my name, although it's not your area, what, what do you think the, the prospects are for solvent research to increase the efficiency for carbon dioxide collection from the oh, air? Cap capture. Yes. Yeah. Um, carbon dioxide capture, uh, it's actually one of the topics that a lot of material scientists and the chemists uh, start working on. So if you think about uh, a lot of the precursors that we have for chemical synthesis, carbonates is one of the main sources that uh, we use. Um, so for example, in batteries, we actually use uh, lithium carbonate as the precursor for making the chemicals that needed for batteries. So I think uh, on that aspect, uh, uh, in the past, uh, so I started the research on batteries uh, in 2000 when I chose this topic as my uh, thesis topic. Uh, there's not much conversation about uh, how can we use chemical method to capture the carbon dioxide. Think about all the chemicals we make that are reactive, they actually have the ability to capture the CO2 uh, in the, so this route has not been extensively uh, explored yet, uh, but uh, I'm, also sure you understand that our activities are largely dominated by the fundings of, from the uh, federal and the state levels. So uh, at the moment, uh, from chemists and materials people perspectives, uh, this is like a small scale activities that we are doing on the side. Yeah. I just thought of a comment I wanted to also follow up to, to your last comment. Uh, when I was starting to engage some of our faculty colleagues uh, in other areas besides my own little narrow niche on clean energy, one of the first people I went to talk to was Ramanathan. And uh, I was uh, immediately struck after I understood his work on short-lived climate change gases. The implication is that, uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, we are not adopting carbon-free electricity sources at the required rate. Yes, we're adopting renewables very rapidly, which we must but it's not at a rate sufficient to meet the climate change demands by themselves. But if, you take, if we could somehow figure out how to propagate clean energy in the developing world now, in the next few decades, by the means that the earlier panel described, as Ram has shown, and I don't know how you do that, frankly, but if we could, it buys 20 to 40 years of time. If you do that, and then we figure out how to solve some of these issues of renewables integration, and perhaps we decide uh, we're going to use some uh, next generation nuclear. Maybe there's a way to a solution. Maybe. <laughs> you have to be. What's the choice? Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is uh, activity between U.S. and China, uh, both at the government level and the scientist level, that uh, workshop on the 
uh, electric vehicle technologies. Actually, last week I was just in Berkeley for the workshop. Uh, so China surpassed the number of cars uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the new cars in China now is 20% more than the United States. Uh, they don't have an option. Electrifying their fleet is, uh, they have to do it. So I completely agree with uh, George's comment that if we work with the developing countries, uh, actually the savings that they do uh, can help globally, everyone. So. Hi, I'm Danny Rar with the Consulate of Canada. My question is for George. I was wondering if you could elaborate on some of the next generation nuclear, specifically what do you think of you know, traveling wave reactor being used by Terra Power as opposed to liquid fluoride thorium and the other designs? Sure. Uh, uh, maybe I should uh, translate a little yes. bit. My question uh, is that English. <laughs> uh, the question was about several specific uh, concepts for next generation fission reactors. Um, you asked specifically about traveling wave power. I'm actually personal friends with the CEO, so maybe I should be careful what I say. Um, I've also talked with uh, experts in nuclear materials, uh, and they say the main concern is uh, can we build the structure of the reactor and the fuel elements so that they would survive on the requisite time scales. So these, all these reactor concepts basically move away from the limitations of light water reactors by several approaches. They first use a different set of materials which have a much, much higher failure temperature. Number two, they reduce the power density by about a factor of 10 in the system so that even if you lost all cooling, uh, if, you, if you pulled the control rods out of the reactor, turned off the cooling and walked away, that it would not uh, suffer a catastrophic failure like a light water reactor will, which we've seen uh, illustrated quite graphically in, in Fukushima. Uh, and so there are, there are three or four different design approaches to do that. If you're curious about what they are, we can talk in the break. Um, but um, the traveling wave reactor is an interesting scheme that tries to achieve those goals, but in addition uh, also is designed so that it could actually use spent fuel from a conventional fission reactors as its fuel source and essentially burn up the nuclear waste so that the residual waste that was left after the traveling wave reactor was finished after about 30 years of life that material would have a radioactive time scale of a few decades, maybe a century, not 100,000 years. So uh, I think whether those concepts are technically workable and economically competitive is a completely open question. And so that uh, remains to be seen. Hi, um, I'm Kyle Haynes. I'm a PhD student in political science here at UCSD. Um, I was intrigued a little bit by the use of the term uh, legitimate energy needs. Um, and I'm going to maybe ask you guys to put on your, your humanity shoes here for a moment. And I know it's unpopular. It might end this very quickly. Um, but uh, a couple of the things that were mentioned here, um, the lithium ion, I've been doing some work on Bolivia and on the Uyuni salt flats where this huge uh, lithium uh, deposit's been found. Um, and we know that that's a very a uh, fragile ecosystem there. Um, and so uh, as well with the Ivanpah plant, I know they've been mired in uh, Endangered Species Act legislation for uh, many, many years now. Um, I was wondering if I could ask you guys to reflect a little bit as experts in your field about what the role of people who know the most about this energy is in trying to stimulate political change and also to talk about what constitutes a legitimate need. Um, I know that's, that's, we want to preserve this neutrality of science and these kind of things, but there's also such a high level of technical expertise involved that if there's sort of a, if you guys don't do it, how will we respond, how will we do that? If we do this democratically without expert knowledge, um, what are our real chances for solving this? So if you could just, and I know it might be a game ender, but. I'll start by saying something related to one of the questions that came before. Uh, one of the tragedies of the way that uh, uh, human migration occurs is that, like, you know, you move to to higher latitudes, cannot is not uh, okay. So as you move to higher latitudes, like you require uh, much uh, higher levels of uh, uh, energy density per person, like you know, the consumption is much higher. 
and then you require technology to, to develop technologies that like, would fit those needs. Uh, and then the tragedy is that you go and you export that to the tropics. So like, I don't know, the, there is a very strong dependence of, like, of the climate or microclimates like, to what needs you have or the human population has. If you look at the numbers that we are talking about here, like, you know, they are uh, tragic. Like, you know, if, uh, the equivalent human population, uh, energetically speaking, is almost of one trillion mammals of our sites. Like, you know, if you put this in perspective, the, the great Serengeti migration involves three million wild beasts. Like, you know, we, we find it fantastic. Right? So the, uh, the problem is very political in the sense that you are mentioning, because like, you, know, you have to consider, there's no doubt about it that any thing of this level, any consumption at this level would have environmental impact, even if we use like, a carbon-free technology. Right? Whether or not like, you, know, you are willing to take, like, you know, carve a little piece of a desert, uh, which has probably like, you know, very important like, you know, uh, wildlife like, in a very fragile ecosystem, uh, and use that like, to generate some of your energy. Like, you know, I, I'm convinced that there are ways that we can do it, especially if we tap on energy sources that are so vastly more abundant than what we need for, for all humanity. Right? So like, if you think about it, like the hydro potential somebody mentioned before, like, you know, what brings like, you know, the water molecules to the top of the mountain uh, are, is the rain that like, came in. Eventually, it was the photon from the sun that, like, you know, that generated like that uh, power. So all the power that we have like, uh, available to us like, is really coming directly out of the sun. When we cut into this process of uh, the interaction of the, the, the photons like, uh, with the biosphere, uh, which generates tremendous amount of storage over you know, like, you know, millions of years, uh, we are trying to really cut and use directly the energy of the sun that like, in, many, in many ways is reflected back into space. right? So like, you know, there are different ways that like, you know, we want to, to, to do that. Like, and I, I think there are sustainable ways to do it, but it's not easy. And, and we kind of uh, you know, uh, generated a, almost like a, a labyrinth of a legal and a, a political issues like, you know, between different countries, between different communities, and so on, uh, that makes this very difficult. So it's, the technical solution is rarely the one that wins. I, I would just offer on the social political aspect of your question there, I would just make the observation that the IQ level of decision makers when it comes to energy is rising. Uh, the, um, from what values? Well, you know, to put it in perspective, uh, yeah, to put it in perspective, the uh, the nominee for the Secretary of Energy is from the MIT lab. The outgoing Energy Secretary is a Nobel laureate. Uh, in the Reagan administration, we had a dentist. <laughs> I wish I was kidding. Um, and also, the transparency of decision making uh, has elevated. The availability of intellectual resources uh, is much greater because of the internet. If you go from region to region, country to country, you see thematic trends that are consistent, that spread like a virus, if you will. I, and so um, the IQ level, not only of the applicants, but also the IQ level of the uh, opponents of a, of a system is a much more intelligent conversation than we've ever had before. So I generally see, and I was senior international advisor to the World Bank for 11 years, and I see that the poor, the extremely poor decisions that were made in past decades are not being allowed to repeat themselves or perpetuate themselves regardless of, uh, of events. So it's a small village and the villagers are getting a lot smarter. Okay, well, um, George, back to you. Uh, you and I just, I think I was the guilty party who used that phrase, so let me just tell you where it came from in my own mind. And it really comes back to the uh, Human Development Index and its correlation with energy. And as David showed in his talk at the beginning of the day, there were two salient points. There was a rapid increase in that quantity at relatively low values of per capita energy, and then a rapid flattening out uh, at high values. And so in my 
naive uh, engineer slash scientist way of thinking is somewhere uh, on the so going from one part of the curve to the other is is where uh, the quote unquote legitimate human energy needs is, is so that where, where you maximize the utility to all of humanity but you're not profligate uh, and so that's my own personal view on what that means I just wanted to clarify um, I'm going to do a wrap up here I think George I, I was in like 1978 79 I was at the political apex of a large county government and I was involved in municipal energy policy I was interested in all these things and then Reagan came in it was discouraging depressing and I blocked energy out of my mind and I'm so astonished and Thank you.